All right. So today we have Andrew Feldman, CEO and founder of Cerebrus, who I met many years ago. And in fact, I somehow talked him into coming to a laundromat in the Mission District in San Francisco. And now to my defense, we weren't there to do my laundry. It was actually a laundromat slash coffee shop, which no longer exists. So Andrew, welcome to the Data Exchange Podcast. Hey, Ben, thank you so much for having me. And um, all right. So for those of our listeners who are not familiar with Cerebrus, Cerebrus was part of this cohort of uh, specialized hardware startups focused on deep learning uh, that came uh, that started several years ago. But Cerebrus is one of the thriving survivors, I would say. Um, and in fact, uh, one of the reasons we're doing this podcast is uh, they've made so much progress that they're now uh, giving away open source models, large language models. So, um, Andrew, so what, first of all, um, Cerebrus GPT, um, maybe briefly describe what uh, motivated this project and uh, are there any updates? Sure. Uh, ben, as you know, at, at Cerebrus, we build some of the fastest AI accelerators. And in, in November, we announced that we had built a, a cluster, uh, a supercomputer uh, with you know more than 13 and a half million cores. It was built up of 16 of our machines. And this was one of the largest uh, AI supercomputers built. And immediately customers began asking to use it and we began renting it out. Uh, we saw an opportunity to train on this cluster an entire class of GPT models, not one, and put it in the open source community, but seven. And to, to train with uh, sort of top of tree expertise, train it to the chinchilla mark, to use MUP, to use all these things that had been uh, sort of accumulated over the uh, the past six or eight months of, of research and progress. Uh, and so we we trained all these models. We did a, a, a scaling law study, so you know exactly what, what, how to predict the amount of compute necessary to achieve a desired level of accuracy. And then we put it in the open source community. And we we did so with an extremely permissive license. We used the Apache 2.0 license. So uh, you are encouraged to, to, to take the model, to use it, to train, uh, to do inference, to use it for profit, to uh, use it for research. And to our, our great surprise and delight, uh, 250,000 different users downloaded it and continued to use it. We posted it on uh, both our, our GitHub and uh, on Hugging Face. And, and it has been an, an extraordinary success. I, I think this was uh, and induced a collection of others to, to, to put big models in the open source community as well. And I, so I think what's that's... The, is, is this like a a specific snapshot on, in time, or is the are you guys continuing to publish new checkpoints and new updates? Or well, that, that's that's a good question. We published not just the the checkpoints, not just the train parameters, but we also published the training methodology, the recipe, and so uh, everybody's encouraged to to take it and run with it. We use the pile data set. So we use the the open source data set, um, and, and uh, we we are planning to, to to provide all sorts of of additional capabilities down the road. Uh, but right now, uh, with hundreds of thousands of of, of users of it, uh, it's actually a a great joy to to travel and to to, to meet somebody uh, thousands of miles away, and they say, you know, we we're using Cerebrus GPT. And here's what we did to it. We put our ideas on top, and we we've been fine tuning with this data set. And what 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 a what a really nice feeling. So, 
are there plans to uh, uh, do a completely new family using a different training data set and a different model architecture? So, or, or uh, this is it for now? No, I, I think you will see from us a, a collection of, of different capabilities put into the open source community. I, I think uh, we very much believe that a, a rising tide lifts all boats. We definitely want to avoid a scenario uh, where one or two or three companies are controlling uh, the, the training of models. I think that's bad for the ecosystem. I think it's bad for the ecosystem that those who are already large are arguing for regulation and for prohibiting others to get large. Um, I, I I think there are. Uh, uh, th th this is the way a healthy community behaves. It behaves with uh, many people doing work, publishing their work, learning from each other, uh, inducing the type of um, creativity uh, that we've seen over the last two years in AI. And um, so have you heard from like other researchers who have actually taken your work and basically extended rent? We have. Yeah, yeah, we have. It's great. There's a, a whole Reddit group and questions are being answered and asked every day. We, we've we seen people extend it. We've seen people use it to train other languages. We've seen uh, uh, a really uh, sort of interesting and exciting uh, proliferation of, of use cases and applications. So uh, we've, we've talked about this in the past, but I, I think we're both in the camp that... Uh, as far as en enterprises will probably end up training kind of custom foundation and language models for a variety of reasons, right? So uh, I do believe that, yeah. Security, uh, IP, and the desire to move faster than maybe the API provider. Um, so what has been the reaction from companies? Are they, did they uh, end up approaching you and say, hey, yeah, uh, so this is doable. Uh, how much would it cost to do one from scratch? Or can you help us fine tune these things? Then that's exactly what we're seeing. And we're seeing that uh, around the world uh, where customers, especially larger enterprises, don't wish to be dependent. They don't wish to, uh, to send their data to some third party. Uh, and what they're looking for is uh, not a general uh, GPT, but something that does uh, helps them in their line of work based on their data. And so they're frequently training models uh, under 20 billion, somewhere between six and 20 billion in size. They are uh, using their own data assets and looking to leverage those. They are um, sort of thinking about ways to convert their internal proprietary data into uh, into something to build on. And I, I think they're customizing uh, GPTs. They are, uh, and we're seeing that the same request in, in, in Singapore, in Switzerland, in the Middle East, we're seeing very, very similar patterns of requests. So, so sometimes I get the sense that uh a lot of the conversation and a lot of the articles are focused on training and fine tuning but then uh, you know once these things are built you start realizing hey a uh, couple of things one they're actually expensive to operate <laughs> right so the inference can get expensive and actually uh, i don't think there there's been a lot of work in optimizing so in other words if you start using these things through an api you know, before when you're doing NLP using a library, you're just used to like fast, fast uh, answers, right? So now you've got to wait, send the thing over. Now you're going to wait like 15 seconds for an answer, right? Um, so uh, what should we expect in terms of uh, uh, progress, in terms of deployment, inference, and, uh, and all these uh, issues pertaining to actually operating these things? Then I think it's a really important point and one that, that doesn't get en enough attention. I, I think it's autoregressive models, right? Like, like these big chat models are uh, extremely expensive to do inference on. And I mean, the truth is they're so expensive that 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 
OpenAI and Microsoft started capping your use, right? They wanted to do it for free. They were too expensive even for, for Microsoft. And so um, uh, we uh, are seeing, uh, especially for those who are trying to give it away for free, uh, an effort to stay under 7 billion parameters. The cost of inference scales linearly with parameter count. Right. So a, a a 14 billion parameter model costs in compute about twice as much as a 7 billion parameter model. Uh, so we're seeing a couple trends. We're seeing one, people working on smaller models. Two, uh, and th this started sort of with Llama, uh, they're showing smaller models more data. Right. right. And, and so the amount of cost to train is pretty simple. It's a function of approximately... Uh, the number of parameters times the number of tokens you show to train. I mean, that's a reasonable rule of thumb for how expensive it is to train and compute. And so you can choose to spend that budget with m more tokens for training or with larger uh, models. And what we're seeing is a preference for smaller models and more data. And in part, that's because it's a recognition of how expensive inference is down the road, that they're willing to... Uh, pay more today to train smaller models to drive down the cost of inference tomorrow. And that's a, a very interesting thing and something that probably wasn't predicted by anybody two or three years ago. And actually, for those of us who, who use these things, uh, it's interesting. You start developing tricks for how to use these things. Like uh, if you want to do a certain thing, you go to a big model uh, but if you want to do a lot of small things that maybe the small models are good enough, you go there because it's cheaper, right? So I, I, I think there'll be a lot of that. And I, I think um, often with the new technology, there's a one size fits all starting point. And, or uh, or the, the, the phrase is AGI. People think there's only going to be one, right? So Yeah, I'm, I'm a little less, uh, uh, I'm, I'm not so much a believer in that, but I, I, I think... We do have a pattern in uh, the development of technology where at the beginning, uh, it's a one size fits all, it's a brute force approach. And then people realize it can be done. And then they look around and say, oh, wow, now it's really expensive. And so the first thing they do is to try and think about how to get out of the one size fits all and and, and allocate small problems to, to smaller compute blocks and big problems to bigger compute blocks. And right away that saves money. And that's exactly what you were describing. And, and in terms of the economics for, for enterprises, it seems like a, a starting point will, might probably be take one of these open source models and uh, work with someone to help you fine tune it, right? So, and there's a bunch of startups coming out uh, that are developing tools for tuning these models. But do you think Andrew will get to a point where training from scratch for an enterprise becomes a realistic option or our models always going to be in the several billion range, in which case it's not economical to train from scratch. You know, we, we're finding for large enterprises, many of them want to train from scratch. I, I think if they have enough data, uh, a train from scratch model will outperform a, uh, a fine-tuned model. And, and so I, I think they're wanting to train from scratch. I, I think... Uh, will they train from scratch on models 50 billion and above? My guess is probably not. Um, but I think they can get really extraordinary results by uh, having well-curated, high-quality data and delivering that on smaller models. I mean, one of the reasons we need to go so large... Define with, small. Um, 7 to 20, 2.7 to 20, something in that category. Um, I, I think... One of the reasons that we need so many tokens to train these big GPTs is so much of the data is shit, right? right? That, that this is internet scraping, that this yeah. is filled with garbage. Yeah. And uh, one of the things that's really interesting when you begin to work with enterprises is their, their data sets aren't a trillion tokens. They might be 100 billion tokens or 50 billion tokens, but they're high quality and they've been cleaned. And there's not garbage in there. And that gives you very, very high caliber results. And so you can use fewer tokens per parameter to get a good result when your data is extraordinary. And, and that's true in, in all statistics, 
<laughs> right? If, if your data is less good, you need more of it. Um, and, and so there's no surprises there whatsoever. High quality data on smaller models, uh, either trained from scratch or fine tuned, is producing really good results for uh, major enterprises around the world. So without revealing the exact uh, uh, detail, uh, exact figures. So what would, for our listeners, what's a, like a ballpark for a 2 billion parameter model trained from scratch? What costs are we talking about? <laughs> you know, it, it varies based on how many parameters you want, but yeah. you know, we just finished training for a customer, a 13 billion parameter model on a, a very well curated 50 billion parameter data set. So that's a small data set for that size model. On the other hand, it was uh, extremely uh, uh, thoughtfully curate, curated. It took a couple of days to train on our cluster and it's producing exceptional results. And so I, I, I think um, we're, we're seeing that uh, across the board. I mean, what, what, what does, if you just step back and you think about what, you know, what, what, what do some of these foundation model companies not have. I mean, they were started in the last few years. They don't have any data. So their data all comes from scraping and from borrowing and from third-party images and all this stuff. But what do large pharma companies have? They have huge, interesting data sets. What, what do uh, large energy companies have? They have extraordinarily interesting data sets curated over decades that they're looking to find insight in. And so while these data sets might not be as big as, as uh, sort of the, 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 the open source scrapings, they're vastly more appropriate for the specific work of each of these companies. And so they're using um, better data, cleaner data, uh, data that's uh, um, deduped um, and is directly relevant to their problem. So in the example you alluded to, you you kind of described it as, you know, it took about two days. So two, mm -hmm. uh, so I interpret that as that after two days, you get a model that's really useful already. It's a, it was a well, the, the model had uh, achieved accuracy. The, the loss was asymptoting. Um, and, and so now might we have gotten better results with more data? We might have, but the cost of improving accuracy had begun to increase dramatically. Right, and that, right. That, that's generally where you decide your model's well trained. So two days of training, it seems to me that's something. So do you expect some companies who are faced with this? Let's assume they can afford it. Do you think they would do that every quarter or well, twice I, a year? I think it depends on the rate at which they're accumulating more data. I I think if they're uh, accumulating valuable data. Uh, at a meaningful rate that they will want to do that as they, they get enough new data to to move the dial. I, I think um, many of these companies uh, ha have uh, big piles of data and they're gathering it at tremendous rates. Um, they're licensing it. They are generating it. Um, and I, I think a lot of their enormous research and development budget uh, is captured. Its work product is this data, right? right, right. And, and and that is something they're spending on every day, and it's captured in this data. And they want the most accurate models they can. So I, I think they're going to train it frequently. So so um, as best I can tell, so the 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 best models out there that are proprietary are uh, GPT four, Palm two, and whatever the name of Anthrop Anthropic's model is, right? So, and uh, if you look at some of the uh, the, the rankings from uh, UC Berkeley, the LMSYS, which, where they use ELO from chess, it seems like the proprietary models are still quite better, but granted, this is general purpose, like you said, right? So it's mm -hmm. a different ball game when we're doing domain-specific things. But... Uh, with that said, um, you know, so the gap seems still uh, big. So the best, the best open source model in that ranking is still maybe two hundred points behind. If you interpret that in terms of this Elo ranking, that means head to head with sure. GPT GPT four right. versus Vicuna. GPT four wins eighty 
82 percent of the time still it but, does but it you know the the the, the vacuna on llama uh or whatever the vacuna yeah. offering is didn't cost uh billions to train right 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 right, right? Also, it didn't take years and cost billions to train it, and, and also and, the op open source is still getting started and the open source is uh it, 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 it is just getting started. I think you're exactly right. And so I, I think a couple things. I think first, um, the work being done by uh, uh, OpenAI and Anthropic and Cohere and the guys in Germany, Aleph Alpha, th these are really interesting, uh, interesting work. And I, I think there's great value in those models. Um, I, I think uh, they are all consistently outperformed in specific tasks by proprietary uh, data on, on general models, on open source models for specific tasks. And they continually outperform open source models on general tasks, right? And, right. and so uh, it's not at all surprising that uh, uh, you can build a, a bio GPT based on or fine tuned on either from scratch or, or fine tuned on top of an open source GPT model that is better at um, uh, biology related literature th than a, a general purpose model. Th this is not at all surprising. And, um, and, and this is why, as I mentioned earlier, you'll end up probably using multiple things, right? So my, my guess if is, you, yeah, if you're well, doing kind of biology focused things, you'll do one of these domain specific things. Absolutely. But then when you get something out of that, maybe for summarization, you go to the general purpose. I think there'll be a, a workflow no, no different than, you know, we, we don't store everything in, in the biggest of databases. We, we have some caching. We, we we have various levels of storage and then you go into your uh your cold store versus your hot store i mean if you think about it that's that's the way most of our work is done where we have a collection of different technologies and we we map the the workload to the technology based on the need so so uh on the model side so so the gpt4 seems to be and i think bar I'm not sure. I, I'm not sure about Palm too, but I think GPT-4 has some notion of multimodality in the sense that maybe you can even upload images to it, right? So the open source models obviously have to catch up in that area. And the other uh, thing that I sometimes worry about, Andrew, is uh, you know, right now everything's about transformers. But surely Transformers is not going to be the end of the story, right? So there might be some new development in a year or two or three. Uh, right. But now we've entered an era where the disclosure is much less. It's in the technical reports. There's hardly anything in there for for GPT-4 and Palm 2 in terms of the model, right? So GPT-4 sure. tells you they're using Transformers. But uh, down the road, what if there's the new transformers and they don't even tell you, they just tell you we're using something else, not transformers, but we're not going to tell you how it works, right? So, I, I, I think the, the, the dynamics of how that will unfold is still to be written, right? I, yeah. I think, um, uh, you know, changing off transformers is, is interesting. It, it would cause the GPUs to be vastly slower. Because they have well, specialized I mean, I mean, circuitry just, now. Yeah, yeah. I'm just uh, speculating that there's some development on oh, the of modeling course. side that that uh, will happen, which we may not know about. I, I think for sure yeah. that uh, that the proprietary teams who are working on these problems have special sauce that they're adding on. And the, the question is, is whether that and and this is sort of the competitive question whenever there's proprietary versus yeah, yeah. if there's a source. fundamental break just like transformers that's right a fundamental break right so that's right and th that's the question is whether their special sauce can outweigh a community working uh against them right that, that that's the question is there enough value in their special sauce uh to overcome the fact that thousands of other engineers are working on it for free so I guess I guess the the thought experiment is what if Google had transformers and never talked about it um 
I, I, I think it, it is an interesting question whether it's interesting. I mean, yeah. it's it, and I think it's really interesting in in light of some of the the the, the leaked memo they wrote saying, look, uh, we we don't have a durable advantage. OpenAI doesn't have a durable advantage. Yeah, um, that, that was just one guy though. That was one guy. That, yeah. that was one guy. I think it's <laughs> it's very interesting. Um, yeah. I, I I think that's probably truer uh, that, than anybody would like to admit. That they, they they don't. I think um, they're they're. Everybody thought Google's vantage was was sort of uh, impossible to overcome, and boom, disappeared. Yeah, 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 yeah. So so we we've talked about models to some extent, some to some extent data. Of course, the big element is compute, which is where you guys play in. I was just talking to. Uh, some people who are well connected in China a few days ago, and I asked them, you know, with in light of this kind of trade thing, what's the state of LLMs in China? And basically, the high level explanation is, uh, you know, if it's G GPT three point five, we have the hardware, but you know, beyond that, we don't have the hardware. So, so how much does hardware matter in uh, in this world of if you want to be at the most cutting edge? Hardware is the defining part of cutting edge. Um, and I, I think the government saw that when uh, they asked NVIDIA to, to stop aiding the Chinese building an AI capability. Um, I think uh, it, it is fundamental. It, it is why OpenAI has required so much money. Um, it is sort of at the ground level uh, the problem of AI is a problem of of putting to work an enormous amount of compute, and that that problem uh, will not go away. Uh, it it has grown at an extraordinary rate. Both both sort of the amount of compute needed, uh, the amount of data used, um, th these are are continuing to grow. Um, so what has I, been uh, so. For our listeners who are not familiar with Cerebra, so what has been kind of the uh, uh, progress on the Cerebra, Cerebra side of hardware in terms of uh, sure. uh, I, capability? I, you know, I, I think when uh, when we started the company, our, our first part was the largest and fastest part on, uh, on Earth. It had 400,000 cores. It, it was uh, vastly faster than clusters of... Uh, of, of GPUs, uh, we we've more than doubled. We now have eight hundred and fifty thousand cores. Customers are now not buying one, but they're buying clusters of sixteen or thirty-two. I mean, it, it is uh, they're putting to work uh, tens of millions of cores on a single problem, and th that is the size of some of the largest supercomputers on Earth. So the largest supercomputer on Earth has about eight million cores. Now those are bigger, stronger cores. But still, you're trying to coordinate uh, more than 25 million cores to work on a single problem is an enormous challenge. And so what we've seen is an exponential increase in the amount of compute customers want uh, to work on these problems. They, they want... what, what about memory? How, how, how have you guys evolved in terms of uh, amount of memory? You know, we we have a, a very innovative uh, approach. We have a huge amount of memory on chip. We have 40 gigabytes of memory on chip. And so this is thousands of times more than a GPU. We have tens of thousands times more memory bandwidth, which is the fundamental limiter in most GPU work. But also uh, our approach is to, to, we invented a technology that allows us to store parameters off chip. So we can support one, 10, 100 trillion parameter models, even on a single system. And... That's how many? Uh, how many? A hundred trillion on one on a single CS two machine. So, but it uh, as far as the user, it it kind of feels like memory. It is memory. It is memory. Okay. It is memory. Yeah. Um, it, it is storing your parameters, and so so, so uh, this is also useful for, for inference, obviously, right? Also useful for inference. Um, I, I think, uh, as we mentioned earlier, uh, 
in the in the old world of uh, CV inference and uh, sort of simple NLP inference, uh, y- you could always fit it on a on a small processor, a CPU or a little GPU. Um, now that we're doing big autoregressive inference, people are using clusters of GPUs. They're using uh, one of our machines that had traditionally been for training. They're using for inference. Um, it's a much, much harder problem in, in this big autoregressive world. So, so the Andrew, the A100 also has about 40, 80 gigabit, gigabytes of memory, right? No, no? that's memory off chip. Okay. Uh, the memory on chip is is absurdly small. Memory on chip is uh, the the A one hundred has came in two configurations. It came so, so in, for our listeners, uh, what's uh, so what's the difference? Why why, why is the dis- why the distinction well, between <clears throat> on and off? Yeah. Look, I I think uh, imagine you're watching a ball game. Uh, you you maybe watching some football, and, and uh, you have beer in your fridge. Uh, th- th- that's like having uh, memory on chip. It's nearby. You can go to it often. You can get a snack. Now, memory off chip is like having beer at Safeway, right? To Maybe at halftime, you can get out of your car, get out of your house, drive to it, buy it, stand in line, drive back, and maybe all your neighbors are doing the same thing. And that's like off chip memory. And the size of the road and the queues at Safeway are memory bandwidth. Right. And so uh, you can access on-chip memory thousands of times faster. You use a tiny fraction of the power to get there. And in our architecture, there's no contention. Whereas in a GPU, by putting the memory off-chip, All your cores are trying to get to it at the same time. And for anybody who's trained big models, this is a fundamental challenge is you will almost always run into memory and memory bandwidth limitations. Right, 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 right. Um, So are we, are you anticipating models will keep going bigger and bigger? Is that kind of, is that the assumption of the company? No, I I think uh, we, we are, uh, point of diminishing yeah. returns. Well, I, I think we're at a point where uh, people are thinking about approaches that aren't brute force. Yeah, yeah. And also uh, the op- operational complexity and the challenges of actually working with a 500 billion parameter model or a trillion parameter model is very hard. Yeah. Right. You you want to debug a layer of, of a model that big? It's a beast. Um, you w- want to think about how to distribute that uh, in traditional approaches over thousands of GPUs. I mean, one of the things that's interesting is if you look at the Llama paper, you look at the, the GPT-4 uh, paper, in the back, they have 100 people who are involved in distributing work. Yeah, 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 yeah. Right? yeah who can afford uh, that? It's, who can it's, afford it's, that? Um, it's basically it, distributed systems, not really modeling anymore. Right? Th- that's right. It, yeah. What's happened in that is what you see is that the problem of distributed computing uh, has overwhelmed in complexity the problem of building an AI model. And I, I think there are very few companies who can afford to make that trade off. And so uh, certainly in the open source community and in large enterprises, what we're seeing is uh, a focus on smaller models and better data. More and better data. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so, so obviously, in computer vision, they don't use as many transformers, but they had, they have years and years of honing tricks like compression, quantization, distillation, because they have to deploy these things in small cameras, on sensors, and things like that. So, uh, is there equivalent effort in LLMs? I think it's starting. I think we're seeing tremendous effort in quantization. We're seeing people try and do inference in four bit. Uh, we're we're seeing uh, people experiment with uh, with very sparse inference. We're thinking. We're seeing, and we're working on on both of those. I I think uh, uh, people want uh, to do inference at the edge, a- and I I think we saw that in. Uh, in in um, the amount of space in a in, in a in a cell phone chip 
that the inference engine is now taking up, right? There's an estimate that that on on an Apple cell phone, the chip, the primary processor there, about 15% of the die area is taken up for your inference engine. Um, and what they want, of course, is the biggest model, the uh, most accurate model compressed down to work on the smallest chip for the least power. And so there's a, a tremendous amount of, of effort going into that. I think there's also effort in that smaller models could run on, G, on not just on GPUs and on our machines on custom uh, hardware, but they can also run on CPUs. Yeah. And so the CPU vendors are extremely interested in these techniques that allow models at a billion three, two, seven, six, seven, thirteen to be able to claw it back into the range where they can fit on a CPU. So there's a lot of interesting work being done there. And in fact, you saw that right away, both with our, uh, with the Cerebrus GPT, as well as with the Llama, where what do people want to do? They want to run them on their laptop, right? right? That's the, the first thing people were doing was trying to figure out how to run it on a, a, a on their Mac or on their laptop. And that that's super interesting. And I, I think uh, it is really a direction for, for the future. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think uh, as people become used to interacting with these systems, they want to be able to use them offline. That's right. right? So, That's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so I think a lot of these things are going to be must-haves. By the way, so there's also the software stack that accompanies hardware, right? So uh, famously, uh, NVIDIA has CUDA. But there has been kind of efforts to kind of develop open source alternatives, most recently around PyTorch 2.0 and Triton. But I don't know. I mean, it seems like those those initiatives are somewhat stalled or slowed down. But uh, so what about you folks? So how how is your software stack progressing? And uh, um, I guess it only benefits your hardware, right? So. Well, yeah, I, I think, uh, you know, CUDA is a, a low-level programming language. Uh, I, I think you, you're hard-pressed to find anybody who likes writing in CUDA. Yeah. I, I think um, there, there are a few in, in universities or people who but, like but, to write but, uh, underneath but, C. But, but a I lot of the frameworks. That's right. right that's there, right. They, right the, the, the frameworks were invented because people didn't like writing in CUDA, right? That, that's why we have frameworks, is people didn't want to write in low-level uh, code. They wanted to write in Python. And I, I think uh, when you look at it, about 90% of the market now is is running PyTorch. Um, for, I language. Think for, for, for language. For, for, for vision, language. For vision. For vision, it's a little different. Yeah, yeah, yeah. For language. Yeah, yeah. And um, I think PyTorch 2.0 is a, is a huge step forward. I think the uh, delivery of MLIR, you know, 18 months back, gave the community a, an, an open source intermediate representation to target. I think the recognition among first Facebook and then by spinning out PyTorch, the PyTorch community was that more attention needed to be paid to the fact that this was going to be lowered, not just to uh, to GPUs, but to other hardware. That included TPUs and, and and the other hardwares made by uh, by Amazon and, and and other companies, including us. I I think uh, all of that benefited the community, so that now companies like us and and others can, can take your 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 PyTorch and run it on, on our machine. You can run it on a on a CPU. You can run it on a GPU. You can run it on on a TPU, and we we all can can run it uh, about equally as well. Well, supposedly AMD has good GPUs, right? So a AMD. Well, I I think so. Know, so so well, what's the what's the missing ingredient there? It's software, right? Yeah, I, I think. Look, um, uh, I my last company was acquired by by AMD, and and they they were in a pickle in in 2012, and and Lisa, to her tremendous credit, Mark Papermaster and the team there. Turned around the company. They they built their CPU franchise back. They uh, took huge share, um, and that was their focus. And I I think uh, they kept the GPU uh, at, targeted at gaming. And maybe last year or the year before, they began. They lifted their head up and said, "Our CPU house is in order. Now, how do we attack the GPU house?" And and that takes years too. 
and I, I think uh, they have a, an excellent GPU for, for, for gaming and they had some work to do to, to point it at the, at the, uh, at the AI at software problem. And, and I, I think they will get it too. I mean, I don't, don't bet against Lisa and Mark. So, um, you know, as these open source models get better and tools for fine tuning models become more accessible, I guess for companies, Andrew, it will, so their crown jewel will be their data. So the moat is the data. Data is the new gold. Yeah, for sure. The, the, the moat is the data. Uh, I think if you have interesting data, uh, you will be able to use it um, either from scratch or in fine tuning. You'll be able to use it uh, on your proprietary models or on open source models. I think uh, it is the data that encodes the insight, and the the AI is getting access to the to the insight. So then, so then, uh, I think the uh, so so there's it's one thing. So once you fine tune a model, it's one thing to make it accessible internally, either. You know your developers, data science teams, data teams can use it through an API, or even your internal uh, knowledge workers will interact with it through a chat interface. But I think uh, it's unclear to me uh, if if company how soon before companies will feel comfortable just okay, customer facing, we trained it in our data, now I'm gonna put it out there so customers can talk to our thing you know i mean well and and we know that all these things can be jailbroken and you know it can can misbehave right so look i i think uh i i think we sometimes forget that that you know let's take support as an example right. uh and it's probably no different than than other knowledge worker call it wealth management advisors they're wrong too sometimes we don't call it a hallucination we, when the support guy tells you a debug path and it's dead wrong, we we don't publish articles about it. They're wrong all the time, all the time. And that's why customer support is but, so but challenging. But, but, but they're on the phone unless that's, you record unless you that, record them, you have no proof. That, that's exactly <laughs> right. I think you're exactly right. They're wrong all the time. Yeah. And I I, yeah. I think uh you, you know, as somebody who 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 works in, in this space, I have a different view. I, I and I and I see this all the time with self-driving cars. I, I think uh uh you know, we we ask of new technology an impossible task. Um humans are terrible drivers, right? We we kill in the US, what is it, 40,000 people a year. It's the number one cause of death for people of under 40 or whatever. Um I don't need self-driving cars to never kill anybody. I just want them to kill fewer people than people kill when they drive, right? I, I would like my AI to be wrong less than the support person. I would like it to be wrong less than the wealth manager or the lawyer or whoever it's replacing or augmenting. I would like it to catch errors from the radiologist. I don't need it to replace the radiologist right now. I'm not ready for that, but I, I would very much like it to catch errors. I would like it to, to, to produce an alarm if the pilot is behaving erra erratically. I would like, right? I, I would like to to bring it in where where humans are 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 frequently failing. But it, it seems to, it seems to me there's lots of opportunities here for entrepreneurs wanting to build kind of some of these tools around providing Absolutely. some of these guardrails, the 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 ability for the system to learn from human feedback. Of course. Right. So Ben, I was talking to a, a startup today, an extraordinarily well funded startup, and you know, they they trained their own natural language models. They they produce extraordinary results, but like everybody, sometimes they're wrong. And so what they do is they run another model on top of the results. And there they uh, do several things to try and ascertain whether the, the results produced by their model is garbage. And what they're able to do is narrow down and eliminate almost all the hallucinations. And that's very interesting. And you know, first, we were so happy that, that we invented models that, that could get it right 60. So then it went to 70 or 80 percent, but they're still wrong sometimes. And now we're going to invent uh, other techniques 
to double check our models. And step by step, we're get, gonna ring, uh, ring out of the system uh, their propensity to make mistakes. So it, it seems like uh, because of so much developments in LLMs, I mean, every day there's something new. It's amazing, isn't it? Yeah. Somehow we've, we've, I feel like somehow computer vision has been kind of uh, not forgotten, but, you know, there's not as much discussion around it, right? So the reason I'm bringing it up is I know CVPR is next month. No one is even talking about it, right? <laughs> Um, uh, but, me. uh, I, may maybe it's just a question. It, maybe it's because, you know, obviously LLMs are text language. So people it's, it's a great interface, right? So for people, but, uh, I think that, uh, there's equally important and, uh, interesting things happening in the vision space and speech. Tremendous, tremendously yeah. important yeah. In, in the vision space and the speech space, I, I think. Um, I think there's a, a, a sort of, um, upper bound to the amount that, 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 that of noise that, that a given industry can make. And I think, <clears throat> I think chat GPT sucked all the air out and, and that cool stuff in, in understanding radiologic, radiological images or cool stuff in, in understanding three-dimensional, uh, models uh with, with ai tools uh really interesting things in re reducing the, the cost of a uh, hundred elements of 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 the way we work live and play in vision it they sort of got subsumed by the fact that with your phone you could ask questions of natural language processing models and get extraordinary results and they sort of the the interface and remember chat, chat gpt was not a technology invention Right. It, it was a user interface invention that sat up on top of, right. of 3.5, right? Which was, right. or 3.0, which was the real innovation and that nobody used. Right. It, it, and so uh, I think we, uh, we had a little bit of that with the stable diffusion moment where uh, uh, everybody saw the power of and then uh, that that's still uh, a lot of people are still huge i still huge. use that stuff right? I, I i use uh stable diffusion i think uh i also use um mid, mid journey mid journey, mid journey. I, never, I, has I, never raised any funding yeah. but man they're they've I, I taken think, off right so. i i think if you look at uh some of the movies created by runway i think that, that this is extraordinary it's extraordinary time and i i think uh I think if we're at the same spot with with sort of language in two years, I'd be really disappointed. I think you're going to see uh, the integration between the two. Uh, I, I think you're going to find what we call deep fakes today, sort of profoundly impossible to separate from uh, reality. I, I think you're going to be able to uh, uh, vi vision and text and speech are, are going to mix in very, very interesting ways. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. And with that, uh, thank you, Andrew. Hey, Ben, it's always fun to talk. It's good to chat with you, my friend. Be well.